spend with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy. Well, we've been talking about faith a lot in the second chapter of James on our Sunday morning class. Spent something like three weeks talking about it. What is faith? Faith is alive. Faith is active. We talked about prejudice and how that factors in. Just so much about faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. Hebrews 1, 11 and verse 1. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Then verse 6 of Hebrews 11. By faith we understand. Faith. In everything that we do, faith plays an important role. But in James' the second chapter, as we're going to spend a little bit more time in, faith has three distinctive faces. Three. But before we get there, I want us to really understand some things about faith and how important faith is in everything that we do. If you go back into the book of Hebrew, uh, excuse me, Ephesians, and Ephesians, go into the second chapter and drop down with me into verse 8. Ephesians 2, verse 8, and notice what it is that Paul pens to those brethren. He writes the following. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. I mentioned in class this morning about there was a preacher who was talking about, well, maybe we put an inornate amount of emphasis on faith. Uh, excuse me, on grace. And I'm thinking, how can we put an inornate amount? Because by our faith, it takes us to that level where we receive grace from God. And I realize that the denominational world has altered the concept of both faith and grace. But we should not shy away from either one, as it's found in the scriptures. We should extol the virtues of, of each. Because if we want one, we have to have the other. And that's what we long for. That's what we long, long for. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, Paul writes to the Corinthians and says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Faith. The other day when I had my cataract taken out, I could feel a little bit of, a tiny little bit of what Phil goes through. Because they covered up one eye. And then they said, here's going to be a bright light. You look at the bright light. You look at the bright light and you can't see anything else. And then you come out and you really can't see anything. And then it takes a little while for your eyesight to come back. But we walk by faith. Phil puts a lot of faith in that stick he carries. Phil had to go to school to learn how to use that. I have a friend, Larry Bustetter. Larry Bustetter had to go to school to learn how to communicate, how to walk. And by communicate, I mean walk. See, Paul talked about let your conversation of life. Our life, by the way we live it, is communication. But Larry had to learn how to do everything. How to catch a bus. He, when I went and stayed with them many years ago, 
I was holding a gospel meeting for Lassen Street when we were living in South Carolina. I'd flown out. Kay picked me up at the airport and went home and stayed with Larry and Kay. And Larry was talking about this light that he has that he puts on his back pocket. And it blinks and lets people know there's a blind person walking here. And that was something that was hard for him to get used to. Now, Larry's degree is in microbiology. It's what he got his master's in. But he got his, they really don't have doctorates with what he went into for education. But he had the equivalency thereof. But you think of a microbiologist who little by little is losing their eyesight and the difficulty they're in. As Christians, the light we look toward is Christ. And we walk by faith and not by sight. We have our trust, we have our hope, we have our confidence in Christ. And what we have to do is we have to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of our calling. And that manner is a walk of life that is accorded by faith. And that's exactly what James talks about in James, the second chapter, verse 14, beginning down through 26. He said, your life is going to be known by the faith that you have. The faith which you show forth. And as he clearly points out, it has three faces. Face one. It's lifeless. Look at James, second chapter. And for those of you that have been in class on Sunday mornings, this will be a little bit of refresher for you. Look at verse 14. What use is it, my brethren, if man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Now, we trip ourselves up over works. Again, the denominational world has got it askew. And thinking that, like uh, we were talking about in class, you can get so many merit badges, and it'll make you just golden in God's sight. We could never do enough work to make ourselves, quote unquote, golden God's sight. Austin Watts was a Eagle Scout. Derek Ramsey was an Eagle Scout. Bruce Evans was not. I didn't earn any merit badges. When they didn't elect me troop leader, I left Cub Scouts. But I was in Methodist youth. And we had to collect various buttons and badges. I couldn't tell you where those buttons or badges are now. They didn't mean anything to me. The works he's talking about are those things that are as a byproduct of our faith. We're obedient. We do those things that have been directed by and through God. And it's what we do. It's not intellectual, mental ascent, devoid of any true motivation. See, we've been accused in the body of Christ. You guys are intellectual giants. But you have no emotion. Worship God in spirit and truth. Oh, you've got the truth, but you don't have the spirit. And, you know, sometimes I think I agree with them. 
but I can't answer for everyone. I can only answer for me. And emotion is felt by each one differently. We were watching a stupid movie last night. Stupid. And then we watched another one that was more serious. And it was the Dr. Carson movie. And when he went and separated the conjoined twins and the parents started crying, it's a true story of Dr. Ben Carson. I got to admit, there was a tear that ran out of my eye. Maybe it's just because of the cataract surgery. I don't know. I would hate to think that I would have emotion. But we have emotion. See, faith that only talks a good fight is, is lifeless. I would much rather see a sermon than hear a sermon. Somebody putting into practice what it is they profess. Jesus taught a parable back in Matthew, the 21st chapter. And it's kind of, it's kind of a funny parable. Because in the parable, oh, I will, sir, I'll go, I will, sir, I'll go. And dutifully saying, I'll do, I'll go. But there was no action. Whereas the other one said, no way. I'm not going. But then ultimately went. We could give God all sorts of empty promises. But we've got to put them into practice. We've got to do. We've got to be about Matthew Henry, who was a Bible commentator, made the following quote, buds and blossoms are not fruit. That kind of opens your mind. They can promise a lot of things, but unless they produce fruit, there's not much good going on there. Oh, Linda and Cindy would look at it and they'd, oh, look at the pretty flowers. And I, you got to agree, they're pretty flowers. But unless they produce fruit, what good are they? So we may talk a big fight, put it into practice. Turn back, if you would, into Titus, second chapter, verse 11. And notice what he writes. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us, focus on that word, instructing, instructing us to deny ungodliness, worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, purify for himself a people, for his own possession, zealous for good works. These things speak and exhort, reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Then in chapter 3, verse 1, he goes on talking further about it, talking about the kindness of God and being justified, in verse 7, by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. What's he talking about? Talking about faith. Doing those things, applied learning. Terry's going to teach his class this week. And he's going to get up there and he's going to write all sorts of uh, formulas and equations and talk about different things that would make a grown man cry because you wouldn't understand it. But ultimately, his students do. 
And at the end of the week, he's going to ask for them to put into practice applied learning. What did you learn? I don't want to hear a yeah, 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 yeah. Put it in practice. Applied learning. Applied learning is simply words and deeds. That's all it is. And so James writes in 2.17, even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. So James is calling, put into practice, applied learning, applied learning. Warren Bursby said, no man can come to Christ by faith and remain the same any more than he come into contact with the 220 volt wire and remain the same. Adam will not let me do anything electrical. Not one thing. He goes, Dad, you're an idiot. Linda doesn't let him use that word. But he still does. He calls me an idiot. Imagine that. But he's right. If I came into contact with the 220 wire, I noticed after I had my cataract surgery, I even told Linda, I go, you know what I noticed? I got no hair on top. That was supposed to be funny, but no. A lot of things. A lot of things. But he won't let me touch it. Why? Because I don't know anything about it. For my safety. And if we come to Christ, we are definitely going to be changed. Because we're going to take hold of the energy of the life force that emanates from Christ. Faith will, by its very nature, bring about a change. And it's going to bring about a change two different ways. In life and in attitude. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. Show me. Show me. We're all Missouriites. Missouri is the show me state. I will show you. I will show you the change that has been brought into my life. Second phase, go back to James 2. Second phase, James writes and talks about, you believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But go back to verse 18. I quoted verse 19. You have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Do you think it's a shock to you that demons have faith? Not to me. They understand full and well who God is. They understand the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And I use the word God because I'm using God in its classical sense, in the uniplural form. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And demons know each and every one. When Jesus was about to cast out demons... They cried out to him, what do we have to do with you before our time, for your time? It's not time yet. We know who you are, Jesus. In essence, leave us alone. See the difference. 
Because demons don't obey. They've never obeyed. They live a life of insurrection. But now to think that James is talking about we can have a faith that is on par with demons? How dare it be? How dare it be? But yeah, he's saying we can be intellectual. And we can even be emotional. But don't do anything about it. It's worthless. Absolutely worthless. We can also face another problem, which John writes about in his second epistle. In 2 John, verse 6, and this is love that we walk. Remember we were talking about earlier about communication and what we do with our life, the way we live our life, comport our life, we communicate what our life is. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This commandment, just as we have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. Now, drop down into verse 9. Anyone who goes too far, does not abide in the teaching of Christ, does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. Love is made evident to God really simply by obeying his commandments. In other words, walking by faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We do what God has directed. Nothing more, nothing less. Second John 9, if we go too far, we're in big time trouble. Our faith is diminished because we thought we had the right to do what God never, never authorized. So when James talks about the second face, he's talking about devilish. And remember who he's writing to. He's writing to those that are members of the body of Christ. And it translates down to us today. Third face. One that's pleasing. One that's dynamic. I look for my picture somewhere to put up there as a, an apt picture, but I couldn't find it anywhere. Thank you for laughing, Peliaki. I appreciate that so much. If we were not on YouTube, I'd stick my tongue out. I've got to remember that I can't be childish. Anyways, pleasing in appearance. Pleasing. Faith that is alive and dynamic. Faith that is approved. Verses 20 through 26 of James 2. What it does is the same thing that Jesus talked about when he was asked, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? Well, you should love the Lord your God with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul. In other words, he's saying intellectually, emotionally, and bring your will into play. The will is the activator. You can have your intellect. You can have your emotion, but unless you're willing to do something about it, act on it, that's all it is, intellect and emotion. We want all three joined together. See, because intellect understands truth, truly does. Emotion desires and rejoices in truth. And the will acts upon it. The will acts upon or responds to truth. Every part of truth it responds to. That's the crux of James' the second chapter that we spent three weeks talking about. Dissecting it into minute, uh, minute sections and segments. And when you really begin to think about it, 
and you begin to drink in the, the magnitude of it all and appreciate exactly what he is talking about and how true faith will always lead to action. See in James 2 and 22, Abraham believed God and was reckoned to him as righteousness. What did Abraham do? Abraham believed God, had faith in God. Even when his son said, well, you know, we don't really have a sacrifice. God will provide. And God did. Abraham was fully trusting in God. Hebrews, the 11th chapter. All the heroes of faith. Were they perfect? No. They weren't perfect. But what they did was they acted upon what they knew. And they did what God had directed. Look back at Hebrews, 10th chapter, which kind of serves as a setup for the 11th chapter. So go into Hebrews 10 and go into verse 24. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Some older translations use the word provoke. We don't like the word provoke. It means, to us, it means an irritant. Get under the, get under the skin. Be a burr under the blanket of a horse. Uh, we want to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Motivate them. Spur them on to try to get them to reach even higher and higher marks. I'm going to tell you something, but don't tell them I said this. Don't tell them. Randy encouraged me today. He said he's now willing to lead singing once a month. I didn't know you were here, Randy. That encouraged me greatly. Randy doesn't know, but it stimulated me. And I walked away with a smile. I don't know if he and Dan noticed it. But it really encouraged me. It is hard, hard to get up and lead singing. It truly is. To try to keep people in tenor with one another, that cadence going. Because you have some people, boom, want to be first in line. You have others who are just kind of doing Siegfried's funeral march, want to lag behind. But the key is, for all of us, we have to follow the leader. Whether we want to move it along or whether we want to drag along behind. It's not what we do, it's what the leader does. For Randy to step up is truly encouraging. For Dan to say, hey, I'm willing. A, a big burden has fallen on Dan. I, I, I don't know if you know it, but it has. When we lost Uncle Austin, Goofy as the day is long. Austin and Haley, if you're listening to this, hope you're having a good trip. But when we lost Austin, we lost a valuable member of the congregation. He was instrumental in doing so many things, whether it was running the board in the back, leading singing, waiting on the Lord's table, filling in for me in, uh, at various times preaching, traveling out to Indio to preach. He was instrumental. He was helpful. And so when Randy said, you know what, I'm willing, that encouraged me. That encouraged me. So when he talks about stimulating one another to love and good deeds, it doesn't take much. And that is part of, of a face of faith. 
that is dynamic, that is pleasing, that is acceptable. First Peter, the second chapter. And notice what uh, Peter writes in verse 12. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. And this gets back to the walk that we walk. So that in the very thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may on account of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Our walk, the way we comport ourselves, the way we address ourselves each and every day has to be reflective of the fact that we are a child of God. Titus 2nd chapter verse 7. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity of doctrine dignified. Then look at verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. That's the third face. That's the face we want. That's the face we long for. That's the face that tries to put Christ at the first and foremost. So, for by grace you have been saved through faith, agreed. It's not what we've done, but it's what God has done. It's what God has done. And he saved us. Titus 3, 5. Not on the basis of deed which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, renewing by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2, 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. God has provided us so amply. So why wouldn't we want a faith that is alive, a faith that is active, a faith that is doing? Well, faith cometh by hearing, as we said earlier, and hearing by the word of God. What do we hear about the word of God? We hear about Christ dying for us. And we intellectually, we might believe that. Truly, we might. But do we really believe it until we respond to it? The song band selected, Jesus, I come. If we have faith that is alive, and we're longing for the grace and the mercy, then we have to come to Christ according to what he has set forth, not according to what man has done. Jesus, I come. If there is anyone who might be subject to the invitation, we would invite you to let it be known while we stand and sing the song that has been selected. Amen.